Capital Report is a production of Senate Media Services. On this week's program, newly elected senators come for their first orientation. Two of those members have some big shoes to fill, and a third, some youthful experience here at the Capitol. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Shortly after the election, Senate Republicans gathered to choose their leader. Senate Majority Leader-elect Paul Gazelka met with the media following his selection. I hope you see that we are 34 strong Republicans in the Senate. We have the majority and it's, it's 34 strong. I will tell you that the Democrats have 33 senators and so we're going to have to figure out a way to work together at some level. Uh, we're going to work with the governor, we're going to work with the House, and we're going to do good things for Minnesota. But before I go into that at all, I want to give credit where credit is due. Senator Hand was our leader. We had all hoped that Senator Land, uh, Hand would be our majority leader, but he's not. But he did all the work. He did a lot of the recruiting. He went all across Minnesota. He set the agenda. He raised the money, and he's not here. And so that's a big loss for us. Mm -hmm. and, but I want you to know that we will never forget the work that he's done, and I will never forget that. How do we work together? Because there is a part that you have to build bridges, especially when the governor's Democrat and Republicans are, have the House and the Senate. We're going to have to figure some of those things out. But we are up to the task, and we're going to do that. Now, one of the things that uh, all of us found out when we were out uh, door knocking and talking to people and holding forums was that a lot of Minnesotans were hurting, particularly related to health care. <laughs> health care was a huge issue everywhere we went. I guarantee to do my part uh, to do the best for Minnesota. And that means that I have to roll up my sleeves, we have to build a team, uh, we have to be able to reach out to the governor and uh, work with the House. And I, I think if we do those things, the issues that we talked about related to health care and tax relief and roads and bridges, I think can get done. The Minnesota Senate will have 21 new members, nearly one-third of the body, when it convenes the 2017 session. Twelve new members are Republicans and nine new members are with the DFL party. We'll be talking to these new members in the coming weeks and we begin with Senator-elect Matt Klein of Mendota Heights, who is a physician by trade. Welcome. Thank you, Shannon. Good to be here. So, you have a busy life. You're a physician. You have a family. What inspired you to run for Senate? Well, you know, I ran for school board a couple of years ago and found that I was able to balance that with my physician work uh, and, and with my family life, and I was inspired at the change I could make. And I noticed that there weren't any physicians in the legislature. Mm -hmm. I still believe that it should be a citizen's legislature where people from all the trades and professions across Minnesota can participate in the process and add their voice. Naturally, with health care being such a major issue this year, I thought a physician might have a unique perspective, so I was inspired to give it a try. And, my employer and my family have been very helpful and supportive. So that brings me to my next question, which is your role as a physician, because we are experiencing um, huge increases in insurance premiums, and there's with the new uh, presidential administration, the possibility of changes to the Affordable Care Act. Where do you land on this very important issue? Well, I land from a very personal standpoint, Shannon. I, I work. Um, at a safety net hospital. I work at Hennepin County Medical Center mm -hmm. and, and I work in the hospital so every night I see patients who are afraid to tell me where it hurts because they can't bear to find out how much it costs mm -hmm. and uh, some of them uh, maybe 10 years ago were uninsured. Often today they are insured but have extremely high deductibles or co-pays that are put insurance out of their reach um, and I, I think we're a better society than that. That's been a driving force behind my run. I think we're a stronger and more just society than that. Um, and I, I, I strongly believe that working together um, in the Senate and in the legislature, we can find some solutions for my patients. Do you have any specific ideas in, in terms of legislation you'd like to propose or things you'd like to see stay? Do you want to weigh in a little bit more on the that? The Senate DFL last year did propose uh, offering Minnesota care to all, um, all individual purchasers um, as a way to sort of buy a public uh, policy. Uh, from the state government that would that would facilitate your needs at a reasonable cost and I would certainly support something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, Senator John Marty 
uh, who I have tremendous respect for, a longtime friend of mine, has proposed some more dramatic solutions uh, for the entire state. Uh, and certainly those should be part of the discussion, something that we look at for how to, how to become a better Minnesota and ensure that health care isn't something that's only allotted to the privileged few. When you were out campaigning, knocking on doors, what kinds of messages did you hear from the constituents? You know, I'm filling a seat that was filled for 30 years with uh, great distinguishment uh, by Senator John, uh, sorry, Senator Metzen. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I tried to ask at every door, what did Jim do well? You know, what did, mm -hmm. you, what did you like about how he handled this seat? And, and I heard again and again uh, that Jim reached across the aisle and had friends across the chamber, uh, a trait that's perhaps gone out of fashion uh, these days. Uh, and also that he was present in the community and everyone seemed to have a personal connection to Jim. Mm -hmm. And I take that as a, as a real charge uh, as we go forward and as I try to fill those shoes to, to live up to that standard that he set. So that's what I was hearing at the doors and then I was hearing quite a bit about the anxiety over, over health care rates as you say. Uh, and people I think were hopeful uh, that a physician such as myself could offer some insight. In addition to health care, were there any other major concerns among your constituents? Education came up again and okay. again. Uh, families not feeling that they were going to be able to afford college for their kids uh, mm -hmm. or that their own kids' education maybe uh, wasn't as robust as they would hope it would be. Mm -hmm. I think my experience on a school board and my experience having five children of my own in mm -hmm. the public school system uh, spoke to that and, and certainly I'll try to address those issues in my work. During the election season, there was much discussion about the rural-urban divide in the state. Um, so some people are actually viewing Minnesota as two states. And what's your view? How do you see Minnesota? Well, I'm a suburban legislator. And in fact, suburban legislators are the predominant uh, caucus within the Senate uh, at this time. We have the most seats. And, and I think uh, that's a good position to be in right now. I think we can speak to the issues that occur in the cities. And we can also speak to the issues that occur in rural areas. and. Uh, so if there's a bridge to the divide, uh, I hope I can be part of that, and I hope my colleagues in the Suburban Caucus can, can contribute to that. Certainly the anxieties of the two communities are very different, but mm -hmm. I, I firmly believe that we have more that unites us as Minnesotans than divides us, and uh, I'll keep speaking from that perspective. Um, we already touched on this, uh, the late Senator Jim Metzen, he, he's a legend. They're big shoes to fill. Phil, are you... Um, do you feel that you can handle the weight of that legacy? <laughs> I'll never be Jim Metzen. Uh, Jim brought the whole package. Uh, he was smart, uh, he was judicious, he was thoughtful, and he had a huge personality and, and he was beloved. Um, my job, uh, being a first time legislature with not even one day under my boots, is to keep my head down, pay attention, and learn as much as I can from the people who worked with Jim, mm -hmm. uh, understand uh, what he knew and, and how he did it well, and that's what I'm gonna strive to do. Your caucus will be in the minority. What would you like the Republicans to know about you? So I work as a physician. I'm not a lifetime politician. Um, and I go into work uh, every day and get the job done. Uh, often I work with people that don't agree with me. Um, let's say I see a patient with appendicitis and there's a surgeon that I'm working with and we don't necessarily get along, uh, but we get the job done at the end of the mm -hmm. shift and the appendix gets out and... Uh, Hopefully. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, and that's the charge I take to my legislative work. Um, we don't have to agree, but we do have to do the job that mm -hmm. Minnesotans expect of us. We have to pass a tax bill and a transportation bill and a bonding bill. Uh, and it's going to take some humility on my part. Certainly, I think it's going to take humility on the part of the opposition party. Um, so that we can make sure that the, the Minnesotans are served uh, and the legislation that's necessary is passed. That's what I'd like them to know. And, and also, you know, all, all the rage these days, Shannon, is this um, musical Hamilton. Yes. And my kids are uh, watching that all the time, listening to the music. And, and inspired by that, I picked up the book The Federalist shortly after my election. Uh, and Federalist 62 speaks about what's the role of the Senate. What did, what did the Founding Fathers mean for the Senate to do uh, and it's considered to be a, pa a break or a pause on the passions of the people. We've had a, a revolutionary election uh, mm -hmm. where chambers have changed, the presidency has changed, and I think the Founding Fathers would envision the Senate as a way to moderate that revolutionary change and to think about things and to pause uh, so, that, um, so that we make wise decisions in the long term. That's the leadership that I've seen Tom Bach bring to the Senate, mm -hmm. and in the minority party, that's, that's the type of voice I'd like to bring. Senator-elect Klein, 
congratulations on your election, and I look forward to seeing what you do in the Senate. Thank you, Shannon. The Republican Party has taken over the majority in the Minnesota Senate, and joining me now in the studio to talk about his district is Senator-elect Mark Johnson of East Grand Forks. Welcome. Well, thank you, Shannon. You have, I think, the farthest commute of anyone who represents the state of Minnesota. What do you want those of us who live here in the Twin Cities to know about where you come from? Sure. No, it's it's a nice commute. You can get a lot of telephone calls in during that time, but it's about a five-hour drive from mm -hmm. uh, here up to East Grand Forks. Uh, it's a it's a great part of the state. You know, we just got done with harvest up there, so there's a lot of excitement in the air. It, it's an area of a lot of small business, uh, a lot of small farms, family-oriented. Uh, it's a great place to a great place to live. There's there's a lot of excitement right now. It's deer hunting too, so mm -hmm. people are out in the field uh, chasing the big one. Um, but it, it, you know, I really uh, I lived down in Rochester for a while. Really missed it and and ended up back up there and and just love it. Just love that area. So yeah, great place okay. to be. Um, so as you were campaigning for this seat, mm -hmm. you were out knocking on doors. What did what kinds of messages did you hear from the voters? I think I think there are a couple of things that that I really heard a lot about. Um, first of all, and I think everybody this this isn't just rural Minnesota. This is metro. This is this is throughout Minnesota. But healthcare, mm -hmm. healthcare is scaring people, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a real signal to the limitations of what effective government can do. And people are the election we saw people kind of pull back um, as to the responsibility that government would have in their life. And that we really saw that in rural Minnesota. So that was n number one. Uh, number two, um, you know, like I said, we are a community of small business mm -hmm. and small farms. Mm -hmm. um, so when we're talking about being fourth highest in the nation for business and personal taxes as a state, that really hurts our area. A lot of people uh, in my community spend a lot of money, a lot of their money on, on taxes because, you know, farmers, they, they own a lot of land, but that's an asset that, that you might just trade in. That's something you're passing down from generation to generation. So when we're taxing farmers, when we're taxing businesses, that's their legacy that, that uh, the state government is reaching in and taking away. But, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, you're a small business owner. Correct. What are some really, I mean, you're talking about tax relief as being one issue. Yeah. Are there other issues that are important for those small, rural, outstate, small businesses, small farmers that, that you, that point of view that you want to bring to the capital? Sure. That's, that's exactly uh, what I'd like to do going forward is we don't, we, I don't encourage um, subsidies or support or, or things like that for business. I think we got to have an a environment where businesses can thrive. If it's a good product, a good service, that's what I'd like to see. And, and that's what I hope that we can do down here, is not pick winners and losers, but to really support businesses that are providing a service that people, people would like, a product mm -hmm. people would like. Mm -hmm. And so we don't need, we don't need to be um, giving out all sorts of incentives to businesses, but just let them do the things that, they, that, that we're demanding from business. Um, and that's gonna be pretty important going forward. You are replacing a legendary senator, yeah. Senator Leroy Stumpf. Um, he's well respected on both sides of the aisle for his ability to work with yeah. others. Do you know Senator Stumpf? In, uh, I've met Senator Stumpf uh, one time. Okay. And so most of, of my knowledge of, of Leroy is through the people that have worked with him. Okay. And even in the Republican caucus, there's great respect uh, for that man. Um, he mm -hmm. is. He's a legend, and it's a big responsibility, uh, big big shoes to fill. And I think the key to his success, why people like Leroy so well, even in Republican Northwest Minnesota, is that he, he listened to everybody. He was a very friendly guy. He built on relationships, and that was important. Mm -hmm. People respect that. And Do you think your constituents are hoping that you will continue that tradition? Oh, I think so. I would yeah. think so. You know, the um, NPR did a, a piece on our race up, up, up north mm -hmm. and it was uh, one of the most civil races in Minnesota. And I think that's, that really speaks of people up there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's Minnesota nice. You know, maybe they're going to vote for you, maybe they're not. 
but they're going to have a conversation mm -hmm. with you. And we just enjoy that. We enjoy that so much. So as representing that area, um, I, would, I would definitely like to move that tradition forward. So there was a lot of talk this election season about the rural-urban divide and, Minis sure. and the idea that Minnesota is two different states. What is your view of Minnesota? That's an excellent question. I, coming from Northwest Minnesota, I mean, five hours away from the capital, mm -hmm. uh, that's definitely a feeling that we, that we have. Um, a feeling that we're not being understood up in Northwest Minnesota. Uh, and, it, and there is a, a degree of that because I mean, the, the interest, the, just the daily living is so different when you get down close to a metro area uh, as opposed to a rural area. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. I don't want to build upon that distinction, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I do want to come down and, and say, you know, hey, here are some very important things to rural constituents. And, you know, if we're talking roads and bridges, that, that's, a, that's a big issue in, mm -hmm. in my neck of the woods. Uh, we're talking about tax policy because we're right next to North Dakota, which is a very business friendly uh, state. So I've seen businesses jump across uh, from East Grand Forks where I live over to Grand Forks on the other side of the river. Um, so there are a number of issues that, that only rural areas might face um, that may get forgotten. So I want to make sure that that's something that that people are reminded of uh, the legislature. And so some of these things that you're talking about, are these things that drew you to run for this seat? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. When, when there was, early in the year, when, when we saw the, who was running for the endorsement in the Republican Party, mm -hmm. I felt like I had a perspective that maybe the other contestants didn't. Um, small business, um, I, I'm an attorney, both my wife and I are attorneys. Okay. So, it, not the, but it gives you a different perspective. Um, you know, I, I go and pour concrete during the summertime, and then I practice law in the wintertime. Um, so, and now you're going to practice legislation also. Well, that's, that's <laughs> the idea here, yes, yes. So we're, we're looking forward to that. And, and I felt like I could give a voice to represent the, the area very well, just because it is made up of small business people, of, of farmers, and, mm -hmm. and I kind of understand that, that aspect of our area. And quickly before we go, what do you want the Democrats and the minority to know about you? Well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to working uh, in the majority. Um, but I understand that, that when you are in the minority, you're in a tough position. Mm -hmm. And I look forward to working with them. I really do. I, I think this is going to be a wonderful session. Um, and I know there's going to be some adjustments and changes, mm -hmm. and they've got new faces over on that side too. And I'm really looking forward to working uh, through Minnesota's issues with them. Senator-elect, congratulations on your win, and Thank I look you, forward Sharon. to seeing what you do this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. The Task Force on Healthcare Financing began work in earnest this week, looking at ways to reduce rising health care premiums in the individual market. They also heard from Minnesotans worried about their future insurance costs. So I went back to researching options, and I found one, one that I can't afford. My premiums alone will be over $10,000 this year. My individual deductible is $6,400 and my family $12,800. That's a deductible that I need to meet in January. One of my medications alone is $600 per pill and I take it 21 days out of the month. I don't have the money to meet my healthcare costs this year. I'm a single mom, I live in a little Rambler, I drive a really sensible Toyota. We volunteer, we give back to our community. My kids even work. They're 14 and 17. Insurance has become a luxury item for me. My wife and I are both 58 years old. We're self-employed farmers who purchase our bronze level health, or who purchase our health insurance on the individual market. The 76% increase we just received for our bronze level premium with Medica is shocking. We're expected to pay $22,224 for coverage in 2017, and that's with a deductible of $12,800. <clears throat> that is $1,852 monthly, or over $61 a day. Our premiums also increased 69% from 2013 through 2016, with a 45% level increase in 2016 alone, and that was with a health partner's plan. This year's 76% increase had us considering dropping coverage entirely, paying the penalty, and risking losing everything we've worked for. 
in the event of a serious illness or accident. Medica's renewal website says the company spent $1.38 for every dollar received in premiums in 2015. But we in the individual market should not have to close that gap alone. The burden must be shared. My family is on Minnesota Care and has been for several years. We have an affordable premium, no deductible, reasonable co-pays, and really good health care. We are healthy and working and taking care of our children, our land, and our community. We currently have to keep our income below a certain level in order to qualify for Minnesota care because we cannot, like we've heard and like so many Minnesotans, afford insurance on the individual market. Expand Minnesota care, have sliding scale premiums based on income level, and eliminate the individual market. We just come out of a meeting that we did in New Orleans, Minnesota, of about 75 people that came out just on this issue of health care, of this being a crisis. The purpose of the meeting was twofold, and I'd like to share that with you. One, this health care system is in crisis and needs a serious fix. And the second piece was to help people deal with the immediate crisis for 2017. To do a fix, we must decide what is the priority, uh, people's lives or the marketplace. Uh, the word consumer means people's lives are not placed first. And we need to really start talking about the language that we're using around this table when we're going to try and fix this problem. It ought to be about people's lives. That ought to be the number one piece. Not a consumer, not a customer. This is about people. Insurance companies delivered a clear message this past year. It's profits before people. When the first stories broke this summer, it was all about the profits. It wasn't about the pain and what the people are facing out in rural Minnesota. Another new senator began his legislative career as a Senate page, just five short years ago. Joining me now in the studio is Senator-elect Andrew Matthews of Malacca. Welcome. Thank you, Shannon. So five years ago you were a Senate page, four years ago you were a House page. What led you to do that kind of work? It started back even earlier in 2005. Uh, my representative, Sandra Erickson, invited me to the high school page program. And so I applied for that and was accepted that year. And that was a tremendous experience of getting the hands-on picture of how the legislative process works. So several years later, I had an interest in, uh, in being there, uh, helping the local officials that are there to be effective in their jobs. So I applied and was hired to be a committee page first in the Senate in uh, 2011. And what did you gain from that experience? It gave me a really good perspective of the daily in and out, the daily function that senators do. That not everything is a glorious looking, charge the hill type of situation, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of daily grind of meetings, of people to speak with, mm -hmm. um, things that happen behind closed doors and away from the public's eye that is vitally important. Did you ever imagine that five years after that Senate page experience, you would yourself become a senator? I did not. I, I have been politically active before. I have helped on a lot of campaigns. I thought maybe someday uh, it would be something I'd take an interest in, mm -hmm. but was not expecting uh, an open door this early. And uh, when Senator Dave Brown, my predecessor, decided to retire, mm -hmm. uh, it surprised me at the first because Senator Brown was a good friend of mine. I was a strong supporter of his. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, after a short time, sat my family down and said, I think we should think about this and pray about this as to whether or not I should move forward with the run. And every single one of my family members was fully supportive and said they would uh, they would help 100% uh, on board if we launched a campaign. So uh, we made the decision to do that, and and, uh, and was, here you are. Here I am. I was elected. So you have a long list of community and civic involvement: pastor, youth teacher, mentor, farmer, family, small business, legislative aid, local activist. What are you most passionate about? 
I am passionate about helping people, about helping people's lives, bettering people's lives. Um, that was my goal uh, through my uh, pastorate, through the uh, youth uh, teach the youth programs I would teach at. Um, in my current role today and the job functions that I do today as, as a uh, veterans caseworker has okay. been to help solve problems in whatever, whether I can help in a small way or whether I contribute in a large way. To be one to care for people, to love people, to help solve problems to the best of my abilities and uh, to be a support for them. So in the Mille Lacs County Times, you said, quote, I'm running because the current majority in the Senate isn't listening to the people of Minnesota anymore. Um, there's been much written about the rural-urban divide. What is your view of Minnesota? So the specific project is there were road projects in Senate District 15 mm -hmm. that the community had been asking for that were needed, uh, safety improvements and upgrades because of growing, uh, growing developments. And so last year we had finally gotten some of those projects in the final transportation bonding bill, mm -hmm. which died on the last day of That's session. Okay. So I told the people all through the campaign trail, we need to not let, um, not let those necessary projects just die in that fashion that I was going to pick that back up. I didn't know back then whether there'd be a special session mm -hmm. to correct or pass that bill or not, mm -hmm. and said that I would take those issues and keep representing this district uh, and bring those projects back up again uh, in order to see them all the way through. So that must have been one thing that you heard about on the campaign trail. What it else was. did you hear about? Another big issue is the Sherco power plant in the south end of my district mm -hmm. in Becker. Energy is of great importance to the people. They want to see affordable energy. They want, many of them are employed at that power plant and there mm -hmm. are changes that are going on there right now. Mm -hmm. So that was a very big issue that was in a lot of people's minds, uh, as well as the health insurance prices. And I think on a bipartisan basis, we're looking for solutions to uh, lower costs for, uh, for people to afford their health insurance. You had the opportunity as a page to see how government works up close. Now that you're a senator, are there th things that you'd like to see be done differently? I don't know if there's a specific thing uh, that I would point to other than the Senate is made up of the people that represent it. And mm -hmm. I am greatly privileged and humbled to now be a part of it. And so uh, it's a part of the process and the process has stood in place long before I was here, will continue mm -hmm. long after I am gone. And uh, I'm just excited about this opportunity to play a role in it at this point. Senator-elect Matthews, we're going to stop there today, but I want to thank you so much for coming in. Well, thank you, Shannon. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching. Thank you.